Thank you very much. Uh, thank you everyone for being here, for uh, in, enduring this bitter cold. Uh, it's great to see a bunch of intrepid 49ers here tonight. And uh, tonight we're going to uh, uh, talk about fire, pestilence, and death, St. Louis, 1849. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say, and I'd like to actually <coughs> say thank you uh, to the staff of the Missouri uh, State Archives. Uh, you know, the good portion of this book, uh, I called upon the collection of the Missouri Historical Society, my employer, but probably the next group of records that I uh, went through and received the help of was the uh, records of the Missouri uh, State Archives and assistance of their staff. And uh, They always do such a great job. Uh, they know so much about history. They're so enthusiastic about it all. So again, a big thank you to everyone, uh, not only here in, in Jeff City, but in St. Louis and everywhere. So uh, let's talk about fire, pestilence, and death. Um, I usually uh, had two questions in, when I started writing this book. Uh, and the first question was, why did you give it such an upbeat title? <laughs> um, and you have to read the book to find out. Um, the second question is, you know, why did you write this book? And, um, you know, as a historian, as someone that has been with the Missouri Historical Society, St. Louis, for you know, 17 years now, uh, you know, I, I came across bits and pieces of the story while working in the archives for many years. And I assumed that most people knew, the, you know, the story about the, about the fire, about the pestilence, about the cholera epidemic and so forth. Uh, but most people were, you know, uh, they didn't really know that much about it. Uh, so I, I really wanted to pull all these stories together uh, in this one book. But the great thing about it was, is we had such great sources, such great sources exist out there, uh, that really tell the story through the voices of the people who experienced it, who lived it. Uh, and it was really just a, you know, it was really a moving experience. Uh, to read these accounts and to um, hear the, the emotions that, that come through uh, in these documents, you know, 170 years later, uh, that you can still uh, feel for these individuals. You can still uh, hear, you know, the pain and, and the emotions in, in their voices. Uh, and so that's another reason why I wrote this book, is I really wanted to memorialize these individuals who, who really uh, endured so much that uh, you know they they were really strong people to live through such hard times and uh, I really feel it's it's important uh, that we never forget uh, the pain that they went through and uh, and really going through this experience made them much stronger and I think in the end. Uh, it created a much stronger community in St. Louis and actually uh, did much towards uh, making it a, a much more prosperous place uh, in the long run. So uh, tonight I'm going to talk about uh, 1849, obviously. I am not going to go into details about the book because I want you to buy the book. Uh, but I am going to talk about St. Louis in, 18, in the 1840s and put that all in, in context. Uh, and you really can't talk about St. Louis in uh, the 1840s or through much of the 19th century without beginning at the levee. Uh, and what you see uh, in this image is a, uh, an image created by J.C. Wilde who did uh, so much work in St. Louis in the 1840s, 1830s, and 1840s. Uh, and he had produced this fantastic image of the center of the levee in, in St. Louis. So everything that you see there is essentially where the arch grounds are today. Uh, and that brick building right there in the center is the old city hall, city market. They were together in one building. Uh, and that was really the focal point. Uh, the other buildings running down uh, in, you know, along the levee there are warehouses uh, occupied by the various shipping agents, uh, Chateau, and all these very familiar uh, names all were involved in the, uh, in the riverboat trade, and they had these 
various warehouses up and down both sides of the river that ran about a mile uh, in, each, in both directions. Uh, you'll see there uh, that the levee itself looks very primitive. Uh, much of it was still that way uh, by 1849. They, had be, they were starting to pave it with the cobblestones. You know, if you go down to the arch grounds today, you go down to the water's edge, it's all, you know, cobblestones down there. They were just starting to get that, uh, uh, starting to lay those stones. So that actually plays a big part uh, in our story, is the fact that people were arriving on the levee and it was this uh, very primitive dirt uh, landing. So in this photograph, in this image here, in this engraving here, it looks, you know, decent, I guess you could say. Uh, it looks dry, but for a big portion of the year, uh, it would have been just the opposite. So you know, when it snow, uh, when you know, it rained steadily in the, in, the, um, in the springtime, this would have been a muddy mess. Uh, so, you know, it's not just the mud, it's the fact that, you, as you can see here in the image, it's a busy place. So you had all these individuals who are offloading from the steamboats, uh, you know, they're carrying uh, their cargo back and forth, they're getting off with their baggage, uh, they're traipsing all over through this mud. Uh, and uh, then you had a constant stream of traffic of wagons, uh, of push carts, like you can see here. Well, you also have to realize that everything was horses, mules, oxen. They're making their daily deposits every day as well <laughs> to this muddy mess. So you have pools of rancid, dirty, filthy water um, around you all the time. In the summertime, it's going to be just the opposite. Everything is going to dry completely up when it's really hot and dry, and everything becomes just fine grain dust. Uh, I have a, um, a quote uh, in the book from Robert E. Lee when he was an engineer back in uh, the late 1830s. He comes to St. Louis and he works on the levee project. Uh, and he wrote home and he said, you know, when it's, it's wet, it's a muddy mess. When it's dry, it's like this thin talc powder and it gets into everything and it just drives you mad. So those are the kind of conditions that people were living with every day. But this was the heart of the city. This was where all the commerce was coming in and out. Uh, and uh, so when you arrived in St. Louis, this is the very first thing you would see. So this is a, a map uh, of the earliest, one of the earliest maps from this time period, 1844 actually is the, the date on this one. Uh, you see some things here that you might not recognize, uh, things that have changed. One is this large sandbar island here, Duncan's Island, that was just south of downtown. Uh, you see some other uh, sandbar islands here. Here's Bloody Island. I'm sure you've probably heard the stories of all the duels that have been fought, that were fought over the years in Bloody Island. Um, and what happens in the, again, in the 1830s when uh, Lee and his group are working on these uh, dike systems is they're trying to uh, keep the river from moving east uh, and silting up too much. So uh, they channelize the river more, uh, the water runs faster, and eventually these islands either disappeared or they became part of the banks of the Missouri side and the Illinois side of the river. So that's why you no longer see them. Uh, Duncan's Island was something like 215 acres. It was a very large uh, body of land there in the river. The other thing that you will no longer see downtown is this body of water. This was Chateau's Pond. Uh, the Chateau family, the founding family of St. Louis, they had uh, dammed up Mill Creek here to create this pond. <coughs> Uh, and to power uh, milk. And that is another uh, segment that plays a large part of our story. And I'll talk about that uh, later on. Uh, as far as the boundaries of the city, 
Uh, they did not extend uh, any further than the very end of uh, Chateau's Pond. And this is essentially where Union Station is today. So if you can imagine from the river to Union Station, that was the entire city of St. Louis uh, in 1849. It had extended a little bit further out by 49, but only because it was building out so much. Um, one of the things that you see uh, in the 1840s is this incredible population explosion. Uh, and it really was an explosion. It was just incredible the amount of people that were coming in. Uh, so the city was uh, undergoing, you know, uh, had seen a tremendous amount. Uh, it was, what, 60 years or so uh, since the founding of the city. And for much of that time, between uh, 1764 and about 1830, it was pretty much just this quiet frontier town. Uh, and around 1820, you had about 6,000, 8,000 people. Uh, in the 1830s, it starts to grow because you have the first real influx of immigration that starts flowing in to the city and into the state. So you have the Irish, you have the Germans are starting to come in in significant numbers. Uh, around 1835, you had around 16,000. Uh, around 1840, you had around 30,000. By 1849, it had risen to over 77,000 people. So just in that 15-year stretch, you had an incredible amount of people that moved in. And this was a city, again, that was much like a frontier town. It was in no way ready to handle the amount of people that are coming in at that time. Infrastructure was very poor. Um, housing was, you know, an incredible housing shortages. Um, they did not have the city services uh, to handle anything like that. So there wasn't, uh, you know, there wasn't a police force, uh, for instance, in place uh, in 1849. And yet you had this incredible amount of people. Um, in 1849, in terms of the immigration, uh, some 20,000 Germans alone entered the city in 1849. So that gives you an idea of just what the influx was, was like. So this is an actual photograph uh, of the levee. Again, everyone is, uh, for the most part, entering the city uh, on the steamboats that are coming not only up uh, from New Orleans and you know, from the Gulf, from New Orleans, but also from the east, from Cincinnati, from Louisville, uh, down the Ohio River. Uh, they're coming into the city, they're offloading uh, their goods, and they're taking on market goods in St. Louis and then uh, you know, shipping them further west up the Missouri and, and points uh, west from there. Um, so St. Louis, which had started as a fur trading center, uh, by the 1840s, it's primarily a transportation hub and, and a market community. And so um, they had a tremendous draw. You can see why all the immigrants were flooding into the city, because there were jobs, there were opportunities. Uh, and, you know, many of them were transient. They would come in, they'd stay for uh, a couple of years, a few months, uh, maybe uh, take on some extra work before they, uh, you know, headed on west. Uh, into the Western Territories, into Iowa, and so on. Um, but this was the heart of the action in 1849. And what you see is a city that's really uh, in, in the midst of an identity crisis in 1849. You know, it was on that cusp between a frontier city and between an urban center. And to have lived in 1849 and to have been able to roam the streets it must have been incredibly interesting to see the types of people uh, that were just roaming around. Uh, you might uh, see someone like uh, J.M. White, uh, the individual there in, in the frontier guard. It was you know, not unusual to see uh, you know, these old frontiersmen that were, had been out on the plains, had, or, you know, some of them were still involved uh, in what was left of the fur trade, uh, some trapping and so forth. They were still coming back to St. Louis. Um, or they were involved in the Santa Fe trade, which had been uh, bustling since the early 1820s. 
That uh, was White's occupation. He was actually a Santa Fe trader. Uh, and 1849 actually would turn out to be a fateful year for him, uh, not in a good way. Um, so White, uh, in the spring of 1849, decides to take his wife and his daughter uh, and an enslaved young woman that they had in their service, uh, and they were going to move out <coughs> to Santa Fe. Um, they got as far as, you know, they got past the Arkansas River, uh, made it most of the way to Santa Fe when they ran into um, an Apache war party, <clears throat> which uh, White was immediately killed. His wife, his daughter, and the enslaved young woman were briefly taken hostage. Uh, and then when a rescue party went out to try to find them, uh, the Apaches ended up uh, in another firefight and the, the women were killed. Um, so you had these stories that were filtering back to St. Louis, uh, these Wild West stories that were still very much a part of the culture, uh, part of the scene at that time. Um, and, uh, you know, St. Louis was, was right on the edge of civilization. So this was uh, big news printed in the papers and so forth. Uh, and it was fascinating to do this research and read these papers uh, these newspapers and, and read these first-hand accounts uh, and some of the colorful language that comes through on that as well. Uh, if you were walking around, you might also have run into someone like Dan Rice. Dan Rice was a, an A-list celebrity in the United States in 1849. He was a comedian. He was a uh, promoter, a show promoter. He was a rival of P.T. Barnum. And uh, he may look a little familiar to you, if you look at, the, at this photo in particular, he was actually one of the original models for Uncle Sam. And uh, he was, as I said, he was immensely popular. And in 1849, he shows up on the doorstep of St. He'd actually been to St. Louis many times uh, with his circus, his traveling circus. But he uh, shows up on New Year's Eve uh, on a showboat, unexpectedly, with his whole circus. Uh, the city was overjoyed to have him. They were very excited. Um, what they didn't find out until a little later is actually he was out trying to outrun the cholera epidemic that was raging through New Orleans at the time, where they most theater groups at that time, they would go south to places like New Orleans, to Mobile, and they would winter in these warm climates, and then they would come back north. Well. Uh, Rice decided it was better to get the heck out of New Orleans uh, while he could, and so he arrives in St. Louis. And so, uh, you know, you would have seen uh, Dan walking around. If you had been in St. Louis in 1842, you might have seen Charles Dickens walking around. Uh, that's one of my favorite stories, the fact that uh, Dickens, you know, made it this far west uh, and, and was uh, walking around this, uh, the city of St. Louis at that time. Um, people were immensely proud of the fact that he came to St. Louis. Uh, he, his opinion of St. Louis wasn't as great as, as a lot of the locals uh, were, though. Um, the famous quote from Charles Dickens, uh, Charles Dickens is, St. Louis is a nice place, but it'll never be Cincinnati. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so... Uh, Anyway, so he goes, you know, he goes back and he actually, uh, I think it's in Martin Chuzzlewood, he talks about, uh, you know, his character comes out west and he goes to St. Louis and he goes to Cairo, Illinois, and so forth. So he actually incorporated it into some of his writing. Finally, uh, <clears throat> you may have had the good fortune to see someone like uh, Chief No Heart of Fear of the Iowa tribe. <clears throat> Iowa tribe. Um, the, a lot of the images that you see here and we're so lucky to have uh, preserved in the Missouri Historical Society and some of the other repositories are is the work of uh, Thomas Easterly uh, the daguerreotypist <clears throat> and you know he was he, had, he was a commercial photographer he was obviously doing this uh, taking studio photos uh, of local residents and whoever would pay him <coughs> excuse me but he had this tremendous interest in characters, in culture, and so he was going out and he was actually finding 
uh, individuals like Chief you know, Heart of Fear, when they would come to St. Louis to visit the Indian agencies, and he would ask them to sit uh, for these photographs. So that is why we have these great images of these Native Americans in, in a collection, uh, and people like J.M. White, for instance, uh, and Dan Rice, uh, because Easterly uh, had the good sense to really preserve uh, these individuals through his daguerreotypes and through his photography. It's fantastic. So again, um, St. Louis is a, 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 a draw for the immigrants. Uh, you know, as early as the 1820s, you have the earliest uh, Germans are coming to, Saint, uh, coming to Missouri and they're coming to St. Louis, and uh, they're starting to fill in, you know, the Missouri Valley and so forth. Uh, but once, uh, you know, word reaches back to Germany that, uh, you know, St. Louis is, is becoming a little German colony. It's attracting more and more individuals. And, you know, there were, this would have some, some uh, certainly some long-lasting implications for the city, but it was, certainly wasn't something that was embraced at the time by the, many of the cities of Saint, uh, citizens of St. Louis. So, for the most part, uh, you know, you had the, the early, French settlers, of course, that founded the city and dominated much of the life when it was, it was a village. But then in the 18 teens, you have this heavy influx of American settlers, primarily from the American South. They're from places like Virginia, Tennessee, Kentucky. They're bringing their slaves with them. And it's a very Protestant, very Southern culture. Well, you have this new influx of German immigrants moving in, and it's an entirely different culture. Many of them are Catholic, um, and many of them, if not all of them, are indulging in one of their favorite pastimes, which was what? Drinking, Drinking beer. Which was sticking in the craw of many Protestants. But it wasn't just that they were drinking beer. On what day did they love to drink beer? Sunday. <laughs> so you had them coming in, they're establishing beer gardens, and you know, their favorite pastime is on a sun, beautiful Sunday afternoon to go down to the beer garden, have a few beers, talk politics, sing. This was, you know, one of the worst things that you know, <laughs> any Protestant could ever imagine. You know? um, so there's a lot of tension uh, that is starting to uh, build in the community. Unfortunately, you know, I, I did not have a photograph or could not photo, find a photograph, contemporary photograph, of um, a beer garden in 1849 in St. Louis. This is actually from about the 1870s. But I love this great image, you know, again, you know, Germans sitting around talking, drinking. But, uh, and unfortunately, what you can't see, whoops, what you can't see is there's a little sign that's right above this little boy on the post. And it says, have a drink, you'll see the world differently. Which, uh, I love that. Uh, great senses of humor. Um, so, this was actually um, a, a real culture shock to St. Louis. You had individuals like, like Friedrich Hecker. Uh, Friedrich Hecker was a German revolutionary. Uh, you may have heard of the 48ers. Uh, this was a, a political movement uh, in the old German states. Remember, there was not a Germany in 1840, uh, 1849. It was still a collection of principalities, of free states, of, of kingdoms, uh, besides you know, the main state of Prussia. And there was this real push uh, in, in the wake of the Industrial Revolution to modernize these states, to bring in more democratic uh, forms of government, or a Republican form of government. Uh, and of course, the old aristocracies are resisting this. Um, and there were revolutions that were breaking out in this, in this time period in these states. Well, one of the main German revolutionaries was Friedrich Hecker. And in 1848, there is a failed revolution in Baden, and he flees, and where does he come? He and his followers come to St. Louis. Uh, 
Uh, and St. Louis actually becomes like a little revolutionary cell. Uh, they were raising money, uh, not only in St. Louis, but all across the, the Midwest and the East, and trying to raise money to raise more armies and to promote more revolutionary behavior and so forth back in the fatherland. Uh, <clears throat> all doing this while they're enjoying their beer, right? Um, resisting these efforts and seeing these as the, uh, you know, the embodiment of the devil is uh, someone like Dr. Joseph Nash McDowell. And I don't know if you've ever heard of this individual before, but he is probably one of the most char uh, colorful characters that has ever existed. Um, McDowell was actually a very well-respected physician, uh, but he absolutely despised immigrants. Uh, and made no bones about it and would literally go out on, on, you know, on a soapbox on the street corners and condemn them publicly. Uh, and this resulted in open confrontations, uh, a riot at one point. Um, it was, uh, you know, it was definite cultural tension to, to the extreme. Uh, but this is the type of atmosphere that you're seeing in the city uh, in 49. So the other influx that you have coming into the city is this is the beginning of westward expansion. Uh, it's really starting to, to build at this point. 1846, of course, uh, is usually given as the year of the launch of the you know, Overland Trails and so forth, and the big push to go out to Oregon uh, and eventually California. Uh, but all these individuals are essentially funneling through St. Louis uh, because it's a transportation of their arriving via steamboats, uh, and then they're either hopping another steamboat to go up the, the Missouri River, or they're taking off overland across places like the Boonswick Road and things like that. Um, I love this particular painting. This is James F. Wilk, uh, James Elf F. Wilkins, uh, who was a uh, St. Louis painter uh, at this time. Uh, he would actually go on to paint uh, panoramas of, uh, of the West and of the Mississippi and so forth and tour those throughout the United States. But he captures these wonderful images of, you know, the emotion of the, the settlers first starting out on these journeys. And this type of scene you would have seen throughout the Midwest, you know, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio in particular, but even into uh, the Southeast a little bit in, in New England. And you have to realize, you know, this would have been an incredibly difficult step to make in one's life. Here you're, you're leaving everything you've ever known, you're leaving behind everyone you've ever known. Um, in, in a time period where transportation is still very primitive and very difficult, you're probably never going to see, for instance, your parents or any of your family members ever again. So uh, I think this painting does a, a great job of capturing that emotion and that type of scene that was happening uh, so much at this time period. The other group that uh, you see coming through is the 49ers. So in January of 1848, out at Sutter's Mill in California, they discover the gold flakes in the, uh, in the uh, mill trays, and it takes almost a year for them to verify the fact that it is indeed uh, a true gold discovery, a true gold strike, and once this information uh, is released in the, uh, in the press back east, of course, this is just uh, uh, the beginning of a huge phenomenon. Everyone wants to, to go out to California, and it's mostly these groups of young single men. Uh, they begin forming these companies uh, and um, you know, outfitting themselves, getting on steamboats, coming down to St. Louis, um, you know, uh, buying more provisions and so forth, and then going further to Independence and Westport, St. Joseph, uh, and going over. And the stories about these companies of men are, are just uh, incredible. So, in nowadays, if you we would simply think about it as well, you know, people would pull their money together and, and they would, you know, take a trip out west. Well, it was nothing like this. Basically what it was is these individuals, whether it was your local fraternal lodge or 
um, you know, maybe it was a factory, uh, what have you. <clears throat> yes, they would pool all their money together. But they would go all out. They were buying matching uniforms. They were outfitting bands. They were, um, you know, making, they would hire a company surgeon. It was like little military expeditions that they were actually launching. Uh, and when you read the St. Louis papers, you know, the, the people in St. Louis are so impressed to see these groups show up and they would literally march through the streets of St. Louis playing their bands and never, you know, all in uniform and so forth. The great thing about it is, is now and historically in hindsight, you can see what happens to all these companies. And usually what happens is at, after they get out to the actual planes, things fall apart. I don't need a band. <laughs> Uh, I don't need a matching uniform. Um, you know, that many of these individuals were lucky that they ever reached California, period. Uh, and when they finally do reach California, times are very difficult. Um, you know, there was disease, smallpox, cholera, and so forth. Uh, it also decimates many of them. And these are tens of thousands of individuals that are heading out there. Uh, in the 1850s, you see a lot of these letters that have trickled back east, where these same gentlemen who are so enthusiastic about going out are writing back east and saying, you know, if your husband, if your brother, anybody, your neighbor says anything about going to California, tell them don't go. You know, it is not worth it. Um, there was one historian that says, you know, it probably tore more families up than any other period in, in American history. Uh, it was really a, a very difficult time, and for very little return, very few individuals actually, um, you know, uh, were successful in finding real gold and becoming wealthy. Um, so, with all these individuals flowing through the city, naturally, what happens uh, when you have a population increase uh, and you have this transient population? What happens is the crime rate just goes off the charts in St. Louis. And as I mentioned earlier, there was no organized police department in St. Louis in 1849. What they had was something called the day watch and the night watch, uh, the day guard. And for 77,000 people, they had about 11 guys. Uh, at, uh, at its height, they had up to about 70 guys. But this was all volunteer, or they were appointed by the city. Uh, you know, if you were a friend of the mayor and so forth, you got the job. So the numbers fluctuated, yeah, and uh, these guys, you know, they had no training. Uh, they were really just, uh, you know, kind of milling around the city. So when there were crimes that involved any kind of investigation, it was, you know, uh, pretty hit or miss. Uh, the image that you see there uh, on the right is the old city jail that was down on Chestnut. And the stories that come out of here are also uh, intriguing. It must have been an absolutely wonderful place to be. Um, <laughs> what, many of the stories that I would read about, uh, it's like they would, the individuals would be arrested, brought to the jail, and if they didn't simply push their way through the bars and crawl out the window, um, they often just simply ran past the guards. So that shows you how competent things were. But um, there was a, there's a great story, and this is actually in the book, about um, the conditions in the jail. And the story is, is uh, some poor individual was arrested one afternoon, probably for drunkenness. He was taken to the city jail to dry out, uh, put in a cell, and then for the most part, People forgot about him for the rest of the day. Uh, somebody finally decided to go check on him, and when they discovered uh, discovered him, it was his he had he had died uh, over the course of the afternoon, and just in that short period of just a few hours, he was half eaten by rats. Oh. So that gives you a good idea of what uh, life in, in the old calaboose was like. But it was filling up every day. And you see constant stories of murder, of uh, you know people being robbed uh, in broad daylight, and certainly in the evenings it was it was much worse.
One of the most uh, fascinating uh, aspects uh, of the city at that time was the uh, African American community, who was a very big part of St. Louis uh, at this time period. Um, there were about um, 1,500, 2,000 uh, free persons of color in the city. There were a little more in terms of enslaved individuals. Um, but the intriguing thing about the, the uh, culture at the time was that it was that the free persons of color were really concentrating on uh, just a handful of occupations. One was a uh, dray driver, that is, uh, driving the wagons that were, were delivering goods all over the city. Uh, but probably the next most prominent occupation at the time was that of barber. And uh, an individual like uh, Bob Wilkinson here uh, could become quite successful in the trade. Uh, there were many hotels in the city, and that's what, uh, who the barbers really catered to. They would go and they'd set up shop in the lobbies of the, of the hotels, and uh, you know, the clients would be the, the travelers that are constantly moving through. So you're making pretty good money. And what you see is the germ of a black middle class in St. Louis uh, that emerges uh, in the late 1840s or early 1850s and becomes very strong uh, through the rest of the 19th century. Uh, this was, as I said, one of the more fascinating uh, things that, uh, that I was able to research, but it was also uh, one of the most frustrating because, you know, as I said, I really wanted to tell the story through the voices of the individuals that lived in this time period. Well, it's, it's very difficult to do that uh, when you're talking about the African American population uh, because so few sources uh, remain, uh, first person, primary sources remain from that time period. Uh, many of these individuals were illiterate, um, you have to realize that in the early 1840s, 1845, they passed a law in the state of Missouri that you could not legally provide an education to either enslaved individuals or uh, free persons of color. So education is discouraged. Um, obviously, you know, whenever they could educate themselves and find ways, and there were certainly underground movements to do that, they were taking advantage of it. But it's more than just learning how to read and write. You have to have the resources, right? You have to have the ability to have uh, to go out and buy pen and paper, and you know, and record your thoughts and have the time to do this. And, and unfortunately, you don't see that in this population uh, very often. The other um, part of this story that is so uh, emotional is, you know, in going through all 365 days of the Missouri Republican, which I was able to do, uh, and some of the other newspapers that exist, uh, the Union, for example, and the New Era, uh, one thing that you see on a daily basis are these either runaway slave ads or sales ads. Um, and it really gives you, you know, a sense of, of the whole um, attitudes of the of the uh, the racism of the uh, the slavery question that is burning and really starting to tear uh, the nation apart uh, in the late 1840s. Um, you know these, but one of the more intriguing things that I came to uh, realize as I was looking through these ads is for many of these people who again, were illiterate or were simply thought of as, as property, um, they were probably not recorded in any way, any other, you know, in any other official uh, type of, of um, resource. So other than like a slave census or something like that where it might give their name, uh, when you look at these ads, you're seeing physical descriptions of individuals. You're seeing um, a, a little story that is appearing, like Maria up here, uh, who runs away from St. Charles County. And it describes her in detail and talks about how her hand is uh, burned so much that she's unable to use it and so forth. 
This is probably the only record that exists of this individual. Uh, and we can only hope uh, that Maria made it to uh, freedom in the end. Um, and, and we'll probably never know. Uh, but this is probably the, the one record that exists of her life. Uh, the other thing that you realize is how um, slavery is, is being affected by many different forces. Uh, the slave sales ad that you see here in the corner talks about a, slave, a family of slaves that's being sold um, for uh, no fault. That is, there's nothing wrong with these individuals. It's just that this individual, that their owner, is selling them because he's ab about to leave for California. So there's another uh, way in which the gold rush is affecting uh, individuals. That it's uh, this, you know, this family could be torn apart because this individual needs money to go out uh, to the gold fields. Uh, it, it is, it's a very um, uh, sobering when you start going through all these resources and, and <coughs> understand how people are uh, treating individuals and, and thinking about their, their fellow human beings. Um, if there's a, a set of heroes in this book, it is certainly the fire companies of St. Louis. Uh, a very um, proud uh, group of individuals, a very uh, prominent group of individuals in the city. You know, there was not a municipal fire department uh, in St. Louis in 1849. There was just a collection of 10 private fire companies. Uh, and these groups, like fire, uh, Union Fire Company number two here, um, they were almost a cross between firefighting companies, obviously, but also fraternal organizations. And so they would have massive parades or uh, huge parties and uh, <coughs> Fourth of July celebrations and so forth, and deck themselves out in their finery and and you know, have these competitions to see who could fire water the furthest in the hoses and, and so forth. Um, they were big boosters of the city, but they were also, uh, you know, on a daily basis, just like firefighters today, putting themselves in, uh, in true uh, a danger. There's a, that's uh, one of the fire pumpers that still exists in our collection from, from 1849, the Central Fire Company. Um, uh, individuals uh, on parade. The hat up there in the corner is a ceremonial uh, fire hat. We have a great collection of them at the Missouri Historical Society. Uh, Fred Coburn is, um, uh, gives some great accounts of, of the fire when you read his accounts. Um, but this, I love this illustration here uh, because um, it is a, a great synopsis of all the dangers that was existing, not just for everyday individuals, but certainly for the firefighters. And I, I love the fact that this is actually the letterhead of an insurance company. <laughs> uh, but again, so you have all these great examples of what could happen. Uh, certainly you have the warehouse fires. Uh, but you have to realize that you know, with all these steamboats coming in and out, they are a, a daily threat to your lives. Steamboats were incredibly dangerous. They were uh, <coughs> floating tinder boxes for the most part. Uh, the steam technology was certainly not perfected by this time. And so you read all these accounts of how the boats would just randomly explode uh, when you were riding on them. And then, of course, you have situations like this where your steamboat could be completely gutted by some kind of tree roots, a sawyer, or a snag in the river, very similar to like you see at the Steamboat Arabian in Kansas City. So when you got on a steamboat, you are literally putting your life uh, at risk. Um, but uh, you, know, you have situations where uh, the firefighters are being called down to the levee so often to fight these kind of fires. And they're basically wearing street clothes. Uh, and they're hand pumping these fire engines. Uh, and uh, uh, for instance, when the Great Fire is occurring, the water system gives out in the city. So they had to pump water directly out of the river and so forth. Very primitive uh, type situation. 
Uh, this is an uh, image of uh, the only existing image of the city in the aftermath of the Great Fire. Uh, it always reminds me of all those images you see of like Dresden uh, after World War II, just completely bombed out and burned out. Uh, and, it, uh, and when you read the accounts of this tremendous firestorm that literally engulfed uh, much of the city uh, on, that, on those May nights and, and May night in 1849, it is amazing that, only, that so few people actually died. It was only a handful uh, of individuals that died, and yet you read these harrowing accounts of uh, the roar of the fire and, and uh, you know, this constant swirling embers uh, that were uh, in, coming down on all the buildings and the igniting buildings. Um, the great hero of the fire is Captain Co uh, Thomas Targhee uh, of the Missouri Fire Company. Uh, if you, Targhee is still considered a great hi a hero in, in St. Louis history. Uh, he had to have been one of the most, uh, one of the bravest individuals. Um, so, Targhee had quite a bit of experience fighting fires, and he realized that the only way that you were going to stop the spread of the fire through the city was to, fill, to build a fire break, to build a fire wall. And the only way to do this in 1849 was to literally collapse a line of buildings in, in, the, in the line of the fire uh, to try to de deprive it of, of fuel and energy. Uh, and he had to uh, go down to the arsenal, get barrels of powder, uh, and uh, place them in buildings uh, ahead of the fire. Well, as I said, it's a firestorm. You have all these embers, all these cinders that are flying around. And this individual is literally taking kegs of powder, putting them on his shoulder, and running through uh, this type of environment. They were putting wet rags and wet blankets over it, um, but what happens is he runs into a building, and uh, whether there was a hole in the in the keg or what have you, the keg explodes, and uh, he is literally ripped to pieces. It took several days for them to find all his parts. Um, his head was found like three blocks away on top of the building. Um, but uh, he was memorialized, as you can see, in this painting. Um, and there's a street named after him in St. Louis. Uh, and to this day, he is, is uh, considered um, you know, a great hero to the firefighting community, as he, as he should be. And then, of course, um, you know, what the story of 1849 that people are probably most familiar with is the cholera epidemic. Um, certainly St. Louis was not uh, the only city affected by cholera, but it was uh, the city that suffered the most, uh, probably next to Cincinnati, in terms of uh, the number of deaths in the city. It was a pandemic. It started in Europe. Uh, it moves across the Atlantic with all the movement of the immigrants that are coming over here. It sweeps through New Orleans, comes up uh, the Mississippi River. You read all these accounts about how the steamboats are having to stop uh, and literally turn the shores, the banks of the Mississippi into graveyards because they had to get these individuals off their steamboats that were dying uh, of cholera. And they're burying them along, stopping and burying them along the way. Um, I, uh, again, I did not have a photograph, or we did not have a photograph of specific individual who was uh, who had died of cholera. Uh, the image that I had to borrow was of this individual, Samuel Charles Stowe, um, who was the four-year-old son of Harriet Beecher Stowe, uh, who dies of cholera in the 49 epidemic. And he is um, one of the uh, typical of this demographic. Most of the individuals that died of cholera were either under the age of five or they were female immigrants. Um, and it makes sense when you know about the causes and the, and, uh, the transmission of cholera. Cholera is, is water uh, waterborne for the most part, uh, or it is. Uh, contaminated water, cholera, the actual 
uh, Vibrio cholerae that exists in most water, but if you get the right conditions, the right heat, uh, or right temperatures, and uh, you know you get a, a, a massive influx of it, then it's very easy for it to become transmitted. Uh, it's oral fecal, so you know it makes sense that women are dying from this in great numbers because they're doing things like changing diapers and bathing children and so forth. Uh, the one thing you must remember in 1849 no one had a clue as to how this was transmitted or what it even was uh, in terms of being a disease. They were still operating for the most part on the concept that it existed from the time of the ancient Greeks, was that it was miasmatic, it was bad air. So the city at the time I'm sure smelled wonderful. <laughs> um, you know, all this putrid stuff in the street, there's no um, city waste re uh, removal, so you read all these accounts how people are just dumping garbage in alleys and in vacant lots and so forth. All this is festering, it's smelling, and people naturally came to the conclusion, well, if I smell this stinky stuff, I'm probably going to, to catch cholera. There were a few individuals that were starting to put two and two together and understand that filth had something to do with it. They just they had no concept of germs. That doesn't come along until about 15, 20 years later, germ theory after, uh, at the end of the Civil War. Um, so they're, they're going on these very primitive notions. And in order to battle this miasmatic situation, this bad air, what did they do? But they decided to counter it uh, by burning the air and cleansing the air. So every night, uh, when the sun went down, they would ignite barrels of tar and sulfur in, in the streets. So, it, you know, on top of all, all the, the natural smells that were going on, you had all this sulfur and this tar that was, that was being burned, too. Um, one of the, and actually President Polk becomes a, a victim of the cholera epidemic uh, here in the United States. Uh, he leaves office in March of 1849. He goes on a tour of the southern states, like a goodwill tour or a thank you tour. Uh, he gets back to his home in um, Tennessee and contracts cholera and dies uh, by June of 1849. One of the uh, main uh, sources uh, of cholera is turns out to be Chateau's Pond. And that is because this, what seems like this beautiful uh, pastoral uh, body of water uh, actually by 1849 has become a rancid cesspool. Uh, you know, you, this looks very nice, the very country setting, but what you don't see are the number of factories that are actually being built uh, around the edges of the pond and they're just offloading all their uh, waste directly into the water. Well, people are still fishing in it, they're still swimming in it, they're still obviously boating in it. Uh, and the neighborhoods that were adjacent to uh, Chateau's Pond had the highest mortality rates of any parts of the city. So much so that that area, uh, poorest area that was adjacent to the water became known as Shepherd, Shepherd's Graveyard. Um, and it was a constant battle. Uh, you would think that people would have stayed away from it, but again, they don't know what the source is. Um, the city was having this constant battle where people, whole families would die of the cholera. Uh, their house would be empty, and so more people would just automatically move back in, and then they would get sick, and then this cycle just goes on and on. Um, so from the first uh, cholera, death by cholera in, in January of 1849, until July, um, the city was just ravaged uh, by the disease. Uh, one of the ways in which they ultimately get a handle on it is by establishing what was known, became known as Quarantine Island. Uh, the, the city government essentially leaves town. Um, they were so, many people were so frightened that they, they just packed up and left. That included much of the city council. 
Um, and what they did is they transferred power to this Committee of Public Health, which takes over the city, and they did this uh, uh, really important step of starting to stop the steamboats that are coming in. And they're sending physicians on board uh, to uh, examine anyone that has any symptoms of sickness of any kind, and they're taking them off and they're putting them out on this island, on the sandbar islands in the, in the Mississippi. Uh, eventually, the, they will build an entire uh, hospital complex, and it was actually used for decades to come. There were smallpox uh, epidemics that hit the city. They used it as a quarantine island. There was another cholera epidemic that hits right at the end of the Civil War in 1860. Uh, six, 65, 66, they used it then, um, and it made a huge difference in cutting down uh, the actual numbers that are flowing into the city. And I think if they hadn't taken this step, um, the, the mortality rate pro probably would have been much, much higher. And then finally, uh, again, trying to use the, the voices of the individuals that actually lived through this. Um, I came across this great resource. This is the reminiscence of Michael McGinnis. Uh, McGinnis was, um, he was the son of the sexton of the Rock Spring Cemetery uh, in St. Louis. Uh, if any of you have ever, in recent uh, times, in the last couple of years, if ever, have, have ever have been down to where the Ikea is, uh, in St. Louis now, that's where Rock Spring Cemetery was. Um, when they were actually building uh, the Ikea, they broke through one of the vaults uh, that was uh, supposedly had been moved, uh, but obviously it was not. Uh, McGinnis's job uh, after his father passes away is to, to essentially bury the dead. Uh, and Rock Springs, which was a Catholic cemetery, was established um, to handle uh, the influx of, um, of new burials that were happening in 49. One of the, um, the uh, stories, urban legends, whatever you want to say, of 1849 is that Bell Fountain Cemetery was established uh, as, in, uh, as a result of, that, of the cholera epidemic. Actually, they were already in, in the process of establishing Bell Fountain uh, well before the cholera epidemic. Uh, but they did have to establish uh, um, graveyards like Rock Springs to handle the influx. And I do want to, you'll have to bear with me a second, I, I have this on my phone, great technology. Um, McGinnis's uh, account, and I do want to read this uh, to you because it is so emotional. He says, one of the scenes is indelibly stamped on the brain of, this, of the writer. On a very hot day, near the close of the cholera, I was standing at the graveyard gate. Coming up the road was a woman carrying a large bundle. I stepped out, seeing she was staggering under the load, and invited her to come into the shade of a tree and rest. She walked in, laid the bundle on the grass, and laid down beside it, exhausted. I ran and brought a bucket of ice water. She revived slightly, and I walked away, keeping my eye on her. After some time, she rose, and I went to tell her to stay longer, but her answer was that she had to get back to town. She then handed the writer a poor ticket for a grave for a child 12 years old. I told her that was all right and asked her when the remains would be brought. She answered by pointing to the bundle, it is here. She told me her husband and one child had died with the cholera and now this child was the last and she felt she would follow soon. She did not have a friend or one sent to bury the child. So she went to the archbishop for a free grave. 
I am certain he never knew how poor she was. She then went home, wrapped her darling in a quilt, and carried her in her arms to the graveyard. McGinnis talks about how 58 years later, he still can't help uh, but break down and cry at the story because it is, it is um, such a, you know, such a heart-wrenching scene. But it's something that so many individuals were enduring that year. Uh, by the end of the cholera epidemic, uh, almost 10% of the population of the city of St. Louis had passed away from cholera. And, uh, you know, again, there's something they knew nothing in, in terms of why uh, this was happening, how it was transmitted. Uh, it struck fear in the population. Uh, but the, the good thing uh, about uh, you know, what happens is that people finally begin to, to take serious looks at uh, why this might be happening. And uh, in London, actually, uh, Dr. John Snow uh, uses the, the epidemic uh, and begins to do experiments and actually is able to eventually come up with theories which are finally um, verified when the uh, germ theory, when they actually are able to identify germs. So there was something that good that actually comes out of this particular epidemic as they were able to finally get a sense of what was truly happening in the world. Um, that is the story of St. Louis in 1849. I hope that, uh, that you can read more stories, that you buy the book and read more stories.